Good morning, everyone. We send you greetings, all of you at Redemption Hill Church. Greetings from our living room to yours. And we're glad that you've chosen to set aside some time this Sunday morning to worship Christ and to be fed from his word. So I want to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to James chapter 3. We'll be continuing our series through James's epistle this morning, James chapter 3, and we'll be in verses 13 through 18. So you go ahead and turn there, then I'll read that, and we will pray together before we dive into our text. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. This is the word of the Lord. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist... There will be disorder and every vile practice, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Fathers, we approach your word this morning. We confess our need for wisdom. We desire to follow Christ. We desire to know you. We desire to be made mature and strong in our faith, and we know that wisdom is essential for this. Lord, we desire a harvest of righteousness as well in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our community. I pray, God, that you would sharpen us today, that you would expose sin in our hearts and lead us to the cross where we can find both forgiveness and freedom. So, Lord, let your spirit be at work in us today. Apply your word to our hearts and change us for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. The book of James challenges us over and over again. Do you think that you are something that you are not? Are you who you think you are, who you claim to be? Or is there some sort of disconnect? Does your life not match your profession? James is on a mission in his letter to destroy any sort of self-deception and to warn us against a potentially fatal hypocrisy. In chapter 2, for example, he contrasted dead faith with living faith. And now in chapter 3, he's contrasting the wisdom from above with a wisdom that is a corrupt, worldly counterfeit. Faith and wisdom. Faith and and wisdom are actually closely related. Back in chapter 1, if you remember, we saw that genuine faith <clears throat> recognizes the need for wisdom and pursues it. James chapter 1, verse 5, if you'll look there with me, James wrote, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Wisdom is essential. And it comes to us from God. We need the wisdom that he provides, not only to survive trials, but we also need it because spiritual maturity includes and requires wisdom. It's really a matter of our sanctification so that we become, as James says, whole and complete and lacking in nothing. As we talked about several weeks ago in that text, there's no such thing, biblically speaking, as a fool who is spiritually mature. Or on the flip side, there's no such thing as someone who is a wise Christian but is spiritually immature. No, wisdom and maturity go hand in hand. So wisdom for us is really a necessary part of living a life that pleases God. It's a necessary aspect of growing in our faith and becoming like Jesus. Therefore, it's no wonder that James sees wisdom as the necessary fruit of genuine faith, very closely related to this theme of faith throughout this book. True believers, we could say, will grow in wisdom. James's simple point is that just like genuine faith produces good works, true wisdom will result in good conduct. And in order to help us understand the nature of this wisdom, to describe it and explain it, James gives us a couple key insights, two key insights I want to share with you this morning. And the first is found in verses 13 through 16, and it's this. Like faith... Wisdom can be claimed, but not possessed. Look in verses 13 through 16. 
Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. James begins this section with a question addressed to the group. Who thinks that you are wise? Who thinks that you have understanding? Commenting on this passage, John MacArthur notes, it's hard to find a self-professed fool. And he's right. We all like to think of ourselves as wise, don't we? Or at least wiser than someone else. We naturally think that our opinion is, is better than someone else's. We put a lot of stock in our own judgments and our own conclusions. And we all want the respect of others. We all want to be seen as wise. We want to be well thought of. But James points out there's a difference between thinking that you are wise and actually being wise. He's pulling out a reality that Solomon made clear in the Proverbs over and over again. Proverbs 12:15 says, "The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice." In chapter 21 verse 2 of Proverbs, "Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart." James intends to shake us free of any such delusions. So he brings us this challenge. Do you claim to be wise? Then prove it. Prove it. Put your money where your mouth is. He says, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Like faith, wisdom should be evident in the way that we live. James says good conduct is the litmus test. This challenge shows us that there's more to wisdom than just being informed. There's more to spiritual wisdom than simply knowledge. Biblical wisdom involves skillfully applying that knowledge to life. So James wants us to assess and understand wisdom, not so much just in intellectual terms, how much do you know, but in practical terms, how do you live your life? The challenge in verse 13, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. It sounds a lot like the challenge back in chapter two. Show me your faith without your works. You see, claiming to be wise does not mean you are wise. It must be proven. James points out that what proves wisdom is good conduct that is marked specifically here in verse uh, verse 13 with a spirit of meekness. Meekness. Let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. We talked about meekness already back in chapter 1. It's the essential posture of the heart that is essential as we come to God to receive from his word. It is a humble awareness of who God is that causes us to conduct ourselves with great humility before him and also in humility towards others. Meekness has the idea of self-control and of gentleness. Meekness is a Christ-like virtue that we are called to cultivate. It's a fruit of the spirit and a sign of maturity. James says that this mindset should characterize the good conduct of the wise person. But before James describes in any further detail this good conduct that should flow from wisdom, he first describes for us what true wisdom does not look like, which is helpful. If what follows describes you, then James insists that you are not wise. Look in verses 14 and 15. He says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. James wants us to understand that sinful motives, these sinful motives of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, they are incompatible with true wisdom. Incompatible. Earlier in this chapter, we looked at the danger of sinful speech. You remember that? The tongue is like a fire and it, ca- it has great power and it can cause great damage. And we discussed last week how whatever comes out of the mouth reveals what's in the heart. I think what James is doing now is digging a little deeper to show us the kinds of heart issues that so often cause us to use words as weapons. Some who claim to be wise, James points out, are really driven by jealousy. Jealousy. They want respect or recognition that they don't have. This is paired often with selfish ambition wanting influence, wanting to be in a position of superiority. Perhaps James has in mind the same people he warned at the beginning of this chapter, not to become teachers. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. It's often that those who claim to be wise insist on speaking to the group. 
But James digs deeper into this, um, into this bitter jealousy and this selfish ambition. The person with this kind of heart really sees other people as competitors, sees other people as being a threat to their personal success, sees people as, as, as those to be measured and to be evaluated and perhaps even used rather than those whom we are to serve. This kind of person is impossibly suspicious, a self-promoter, highly focused on self, secretly resenting others, harboring a lust for personal advancement. James says these attitudes are the opposite of meekness, so they are therefore incompatible with true wisdom. This kind of person who has this professed wisdom but harbors these sinful motives in their heart, they think themselves to be mature. And they do not need the counsel of others. They perhaps even desire the place of influence. But James says, if this is what's in your heart, then notice what he says. Do not boast, verse 14. Do not boast and be false to the truth. He says, do not boast. Do not claim to be wise because you are seriously overestimating yourself. That's the essence of boasting taking credit for things that that you shouldn't and thinking that you're better than you really are. Claiming to be wise when you have such sins in your heart is not only boastful, but it's also a lie. James says, do not boast and be false to the truth. Sinful motives like these are not the mark of true wisdom. They're incompatible, incompatible. So professing to be wise, but denying that claim with your actions is a contradiction. So don't do it. Don't be the fool who is always right in your own eyes. Don't boast and be false to the truth. These sinful motives are incompatible with true wisdom. But even worse, James says in verse 15, these sinful motives show instead a demonic kind of wisdom. Look in verse 15. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic Back in James chapter 1, verse 5, we read this earlier. James says that whoever lacks wisdom should ask it from God because he's the source of true wisdom and he gives it freely. He delights to bestow wisdom upon his children. James chapter 1, verse 17 told us that every good gift comes from above, comes from God our Father, including the gift of wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 tells us that Christ is the incarnate wisdom of God. He is the wisdom and power of God. But here James says the kind of wisdom that manifests selfish ambition and bitter jealousy is not a gift from God. It is not reflecting the nature of Christ. It is not from above. It is rather from below. It is earthly, not heavenly. It is unspiritual, coming from our flesh. It is carnal. And it is even demonic, the opposite of godly. These evil attitudes were manifested by the chief demon. In the original rebellion against God, Satan was cast down from heaven because of his bitter jealousy of God's position. And because of his selfish ambition to be like the Most High. He wanted God's place. He desired to have God's glory. And that's why he fell. Then he tempted Adam and Eve to do the same thing, to be jealous of the ability to know good and evil and to aspire to be like God. And today, Satan is still trying to get mankind to conform to his image rather than to reflect the image of Christ. James chapter four, verse seven tells us to resist the devil not to be like him. We are to emulate Christ, not imitate Satan. But when we harbor bitter jealousy in our hearts or selfish ambition, we are doing exactly that. It is demonic. How do we know if we have these sinful motives in our heart? Well, it's, it's really fairly easy. All we have to do is look at the fruit that it produces. This is in verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist... There will be disorder and every vile practice. These sinful motives produce a wickedness. It, it brings disorder. James says not only is this kind of behavior, this sinful, these sinful motives of the heart, this, 
this unspiritual, even demonic wisdom, it's not just incompatible with real wisdom and demonic in nature. It has disastrous consequences. It bears bad fruit, bears bad fruit in families and in churches, in workplaces and in our communities. Slander, backbiting, gossip, manipulation, lies, critical speech, false accusations. They all lead to division and to conflict and to relational turmoil. Corrupt actions spring from a corrupt heart and they bear corrupt fruit. James wants us to understand this very clearly. He says, if you have true wisdom, you will show it by your good conduct in the meekness of wisdom. But this false wisdom produces not good conduct. Instead, it produces the opposite. It produces every vile practice. This wisdom does not honor God the Father. It does not reflect Jesus Christ. And it doesn't evidence the fruitful presence of the Holy Spirit. Such sinful motives and their corrupt fruits are not to be excused. They're not to be justified. They're not to be minimized. They instead must be renounced and forsaken. You see, it's quite possible to claim wisdom, but actually not possess it. If you claim to be wise, but harbor bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, then you are sadly overconfident in yourself and you are living a lie. You're not displaying a behavior that reflects Christ, but rather displaying behavior that reflects the demons, Satan himself. And it will breed disorder. It will bring wickedness. James emphatically declares, this is not the wisdom that is from above. But God's word tells us what true wisdom does look like in verses 17 through 18. Listen to this, verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A second insight here into the nature of true wisdom. Like faith, true wisdom leaves an unmistakable mark on the life of the believer. And here we see what it looks like. James gives us here a list of virtues. And it's not an exhaustive list, but a representative list. In contrast to the bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, this is what the wisdom from above looks like. And it looks a lot like Jesus. Wisdom will change you to be more like Christ. That's what we see in this list. You don't see the name of Jesus here, but every one of these qualities was perfectly demonstrated by our Savior, Jesus. He says that the wisdom from above is first pure. This means untainted by sinful desires, free from corrupt motives. There's no bitterness here. There's no jealousy here. There's no selfishness here. There's no secret agenda here. It doesn't lead to vile practices. It is pure. He says that it is peaceable, peaceable, not causing or adding to destructive conflict, not easily drawn into fights, not antagonistic, either in word or in deed, not combative, not contentious, not argumentative, but peaceable, peaceable. He continues, wisdom from above is gentle. It doesn't lash out. It doesn't demean. It doesn't belittle. It doesn't even crush others with the truth, even when you're right. It rather shows kindness. This doesn't indicate that wisdom is weak, fearful, or feminine, but rather this kind of gentleness is a mark of self-control and maturity. The weak person is the one who's out of control who can't contain their emotions, who can't control their tongue. Volatile. But the mature are those who are strong and are able in the power of the Holy Spirit to treat others with gentleness. James continues, this wisdom is is open to reason. Open to reason. This is one word in the Greek text, and and it indicates someone who listens, someone who considers, someone who will hear the appeals of others. And is easy to deal with. It means basically that you aren't a jerk, okay? It doesn't mean that you're always going to concede and that you're easily persuaded by the first person who brings a counter argument, but it means you're genuinely willing to receive and, gen- and consider the input of other people. This requires a certain level of humility, the humility to value the input of others and not assume that you already know everything there is to know about this issue. 
So there's a humility here, not just towards others, but also towards God, recognizing that he often speaks through his servants, through his children, through other people, as they offer insight to us. Wisdom is open to reason, reasonable. He continues, the wisdom from above is full of mercy, full of mercy. This means you don't run over people. It means you treat even your opponents with compassion. Mercy is forgiving when others wrong you. This mercy should flow from all of us who know Christ because we have received such vast and infinite mercy at the cross. God has been merciful to us and we are obligated to show that mercy to others and it should be a joy to us to share with them the mercy that we've received. He continues the list, full of mercy and full of good fruit. Those who are deeply rooted in the word of God bear fruit. That's what Psalm 1 tells us. Like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season, that's the person whose mind meditates on the word day and night. That's the way to become wise. Galatians 5 tells us that those who walk in the Spirit are those who bear fruit. And I think meditating on the Word and walking in the Spirit go hand in hand. And to these two texts that speak of bearing fruit, James adds, those who possess the wisdom from above will bear much good fruit. Fruit is evidence of life. It is evidence of health. And it symbolizes here obedience to God that is tangible and even brings blessing to others. This is a little bit of a catch-all. James isn't, again, he's not giving us an exhaustive list. In fact, if you look at this list in the Greek text, it's, much of it is alliterated, showing that he's sort of preaching at us here and giving us several different examples. But fill in the blank. There's other ways that genuine wisdom, true wisdom, should be manifested. It's going to bear much good fruit. And James sort of gives us this catch-all um, item here on the list. And then he wraps it up by saying that it is impartial and sincere impartial and sincere. Again, no hidden agendas. It's not cynical. It's not manipulative. This list, these descriptions of true wisdom stands in stark contrast, doesn't it, to every vile practice that he mentioned back in verse 16. It's a stark contrast. And I think that as James sat there with pen in hand writing this book, it's hard to imagine that he didn't have the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount echoing in his mind. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 7 through 9. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. These virtues, again, were not only taught by Jesus, but they were perfectly displayed in his life. He is the wisdom of God who has come down from above, who lives a righteous life as our representative, fulfilling the law. But he also lives that righteous life as our example. Jesus was pure and gentle and full of mercy. And to follow Jesus as his disciple, to believe in him and to submit to him as our Lord, it requires that we imitate him. God's plan is to conform us to the image of Christ. It, it was from the beginning. Romans chapter 8, verse 39 says, Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God's plan is for you and me to become like Jesus. James is describing here for us the heart of someone who is becoming like Jesus, who possesses the wisdom from above. This is the character of a wise man, a wise woman, a wise child. It looks a lot like Jesus Christ. But James not only describes for us what this wisdom is like, but he also shows us, finally, what it produces. This wisdom will produce a righteousness that brings peace, or peace that brings righteousness. These two things tend to feed into each other. Look in verse 18. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Again, we find another contrast here. The carnal, earthly, demonic wisdom produces chaos, disorder, and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above results in righteousness and peace. You can't get any more opposite in the fruit that these two kinds of wisdom bear. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 17 says that wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths 
are peace. Wisdom and peace. Proverbs 20 verse 3 says, It is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. Peace is important. Now, to be sure, I want to clarify, there is a fighter's ethic to the Christian life. We are called to engage in a spiritual battle against spiritual powers of darkness. We are called to fight against error and false doctrine, and we are to wage war against our own indwelling sin. We are to put it to death. But relationally, with others around us, especially those in our homes and in our church, we are called to pursue and to promote peace. And that's not incompatible with fighting sin or fighting error. Again, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Paul instructed the Roman church in Romans 12, verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This peace that we are called to is established through love and and marked by forgiveness. It's marked by service and humility and grace. The God who has made peace with us through the cross, through sending his son to reconcile us to himself, he now calls us to pursue and to enjoy peace with one another. And it is in this environment of peace that we have an opportunity, James says, an opportunity to reap a harvest of righteousness. All those energies that so often are used for fighting personal battles, instead those energies are to be devoted to ministry, to sharing the gospel with others, to building up believers, to serving Christ and his church. We have work to do. We have sowing, we have planting to do. And the aim and the goal is righteousness. And James says that a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This harvest of righteousness is is not the kind of righteousness that makes us acceptable before God. No, that kind of positional righteousness comes through faith in Christ. James here is talking instead about the practical righteousness, the kind of good deeds that mark someone who's already accepted by God. It's simply the good fruit of a Christ-like life, and that fits the harvest analogy here perfectly, a harvest of righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. The fact is, Christian, that God desires for us to pursue this kind of righteousness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, again from the Sermon on the Mount Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The Apostle Paul prayed in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, get this, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Our righteousness is to increase, it is to abound, and this comes through Christ as we depend on him, as he dwells in us, as we abide in him as the vine and become more and more like him. This fruit of righteousness is to be ever increasing. True wisdom leads to peacemaking and righteous living. It leaves an unmistakable mark on the life of the believer. James had said, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. And we have a great description here of what these works look like, what the wisdom from above looks like, the character of this wisdom, and the kind of fruit that it produces. The text makes very clear today, if you are really wise, then you will be able to show it in the meekness of wisdom, good conduct. And this understanding of what wisdom is has great implications for us. And you perhaps need to respond to this text today. Examine your life this morning. Think about this for a moment. Maybe even ask someone else who will be honest with you. Do you handle being right in a disagreement, in a spirit of meekness, Or are your disagreements with others marked by bitterness and hostility? You need to ask that question this morning. Are you the kind of person that other people would describe as being open to reason? 
Are you receptive to the counsel of the wise Christians around you? Or are you self-sufficient and combative and antagonistic? Are you someone who is teachable or are you arrogant and unreasonable? Are you someone who is sincere or are you cynical? Are you gentle towards others or harsh? Are you full of mercy and compassion or angry? Do you see a pattern of disorder and conflict in your life? Or are you a peacemaker? Yes, other people do sin against us, and some conflict is unavoidable. Jesus, Paul, others in the, in the scriptures we see couldn't avoid those conflicts themselves. We're not going to either. But let me just say this. If you are the common denominator in all the conflicts that surround you, if everything that you touch eventually burns down, then you need to hear God's word today because James tells us God's word is like a mirror. And you have heard it this morning. Look in the mirror. What do you see? If you see something that needs to be changed, then don't walk away without acting. Perhaps you're seeing the true reflection of your heart this morning and seeing bitterness, jealousy, selfish ambition. If God is exposing those sins today, then please Don't walk away without dealing with those things. You need to confess. You need to repent. Allow God to work in your heart and do the spiritual heart surgery that's necessary in order to deal with these sins and bring about the change that must happen if you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ. Don't deceive yourself today into thinking that you are wise, thinking that you are spiritually mature when in fact you are not because your heart is out of line because your behavior, the fruit in your life testifies that you don't have this wisdom. Please don't persist in being a fool. Not only should this passage affect how we view ourselves, but I also want to say this, this passage should affect how we view others as well. You see, there's a lot of people out there in the world who claim to be wise and they are not. So don't give them the recognition that they don't deserve. Just because someone has a platform on the internet or just because someone has a position in, in your place of work or just because someone has some status in our community doesn't mean that they have spiritual wisdom. Be careful who you allow to influence you. Be careful. The minute that you smell jealousy, the minute that you spot selfish ambition or bitterness or arrogance, the minute that someone is seen to be a ladder climber, a self-promoter, a self-anointed authority, then be careful because their claim to wisdom is a lie. Proverbs 26, 12 says, do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. The wisdom from above is clearly seen in the life of the believer. We know what it looks like. God's word is clear. True wisdom emulates Jesus and brings peace and a harvest of righteousness. So any claimed wisdom that does not is therefore counterfeit. So don't allow any such wisdom to have a place in your heart or to have influence over your life. Real briefly, um, this text is one we haven't gotten to yet in the book of James, but I want you to look in chapter four. The last couple of weeks, the sermons have been fairly direct and convicting. I've been convicted because these sermons confront sin and they call us to repentance And you might say, wow, James is pretty hard-hitting and there doesn't seem to be much gospel. There doesn't seem to be much grace here. I want you to remember that this letter was likely meant to be read in a sitting. We're taking these these, uh, sections sort of week by week, but the original readers would have sat down and read through and they would have come to James chapter four. And James chapter four, verse six says this, that God gives more grace. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. My friend, if you're feeling the conviction of sin today, good. Perhaps you need to. 
but I don't want to leave you simply feeling the sting of conviction. I want to call you to come to the cross. We draw near to God through faith in Christ. Humble yourself in repentance. Grieve over your sin, but draw near to God in humility and he will give grace. He will lift your head and he will grant you forgiveness and cleansing and give you the power to change. Resist the devil today. Don't allow yourself to follow in his footsteps. Look to God, trust in his mercy, draw near to him and experience the grace that he promises to those who will confess their sin and repent, turning to him, trusting in him, looking to the cross because God offers himself to us there in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. So if you feel that heaviness today, Take heart because there is grace and forgiveness that is offered to you if you will grieve over your sin and turn to Christ and draw near to him in faith. This wisdom, according to James chapter three, is a priority. We need it, God gives it. Let's make sure that the wisdom we are cultivating and valuing in our lives is the wisdom from above, the kind that makes us more like Jesus, the kind that produces good fruit. Let's pray together. God, again, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for how clear it is. We even thank you for the parts that are hard to read because they expose sin in our heart. They cut against the grain of our culture. They cut against the grain of our personalities. They cut into our flesh. But Lord, we need that. We need to be shaped. We need to be challenged. We need to be convicted. Lord, we also thank you for the promise of grace that if we draw near to you in faith, that you will give grace, that you will draw near to us. We thank you, Lord, that though we are sinful and imperfect, you do not cast us off. You are so merciful and gracious to forgive us and cleanse us and, and to continue and persist loving us as a father. I ask God that you would grow us, that we would pursue true wisdom from above, that it would be increasingly Um, present in our hearts and increasingly manifested in our lives. I ask, Lord, that you would um, help us to, as, as we listen to others, to identify wisdom from above or wisdom that is not. And that you would help us to be on guard and not to be easily deceived by others who may claim to be wise, but in fact they're not. So, Lord, make us more like Christ. We pray that you would grant us true wisdom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.